What's up, Team 116? Let's continue our journey through the Bible, where some of the Israelites have returned home to the Promised Land and finished rebuilding the Temple, the House of God, in Jerusalem. While they put their priorities in the right order by rebuilding what God commanded first, there is still the small matter that all their homes are in bad shape, and the protective wall around Jerusalem is completely destroyed, leaving them vulnerable. Or so it would seem. So check out this short clip, then follow the instructions on the screen, and I will see you shortly. Over time, the Israelites who had been spread throughout Babylon and other countries began to arrive back home and worship God in Jerusalem at the newly rebuilt temple. But the wall around Jerusalem had still not been rebuilt, leaving it vulnerable to an attack. There was an Israelite named Nehemiah who was living in Susa at the time. When he was told that there was no wall to protect them, he wept and prayed, asking God to help rebuild the wall. Nehemiah returned to Jerusalem and gathered the priests and officials and told them of his plan. The plan worked and the wall was rebuilt in only 52 days. Nehemiah wanted to make sure the Israelites were not only safe, but worshiped God with their whole lives. So after the wall was completed, he gathered all of the Israelites and the priest, Ezra, read to them from the book of Moses. The people understood that they were not currently living God's ways. So they began to weep, but Ezra stopped them, instructing them to instead celebrate all that God had done and return to God's ways. So the Israelites did what Ezra said and began to party. This went on for several days. A short time after this, God sent another prophet named Malachi to the Israelites. Malachi warned the people of what would happen if they turned from God's ways, but also reminded the people of God's promise to bless Israel and use them to bless the entire world. After Malachi, God did not speak to the Israelites through a prophet for 400 years, but God would not be silent forever. So my see the story this week, we have a string around the finger. Now, it's usually a symbol of needing to remember something, and that might seem a bit odd when talking about a wall, but by the end, I think you'll get why this is what I'm using as the main point this week. So we left off in Jerusalem with the temple being fully rebuilt in spite of some attempts to get them to stop, and the people were celebrating and praising God. But their homes and the protective wall were still in shambles. So we're going to transition from the people in Jerusalem back to Babylon and meet up with a guy named Nehemiah, who was also an Israelite. Now that we're friends, you should know that my name is Nehemiah. When he questioned some, someone coming back from Judah about how the people were doing, he was told, Those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. He wanted to help out his people and prayed to God about how to. And then we're left with this interesting nugget of gold in chapter 1. I was cupbearer to the king. Now this is such a short line said right at the end of the chapter that it's easy to miss or read past. But it's so important because these six words set up the opportunity God presents him. Being cupbearer to the king... Nehemiah would be around the king every time food or drink is presented to him. So he's around the king a lot, which meant the king got to know Nehemiah's behaviors. And when wine was brought for the king, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, Why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, What is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king. 
If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Nehemiah had prayed for an opportunity, and God presented it to him through the king recognizing that something was not right with Nehemiah. The king genuinely expressed concern about Nehemiah's sadness, something that most kings would not feel towards their servants. The other part to this is that Nehemiah didn't shy away from the opportunity. He recognized the opening, and he openly and faithfully expressed his true feelings and desires to the king. Feelings of depression and anxiety over the safety of his people, and his desire to go lead the wall rebuilding effort to help ensure their safety. All feelings and desires that the king not only listened to, but allowed Nehemiah to go act on, sending him off to Jerusalem with whatever he needed to fulfill the task. But, did you catch something else important? That he prayed before answering the king. How many of us actually think to pray to God for the right words to say in a situation, especially one as important as this? But I don't know what to say. Why don't you say anything, George? Say, well, whatever's natural. Well, the first thing that comes into your mind. Nothing's coming to my mind. We should. Nehemiah did. And the words God gave him made the king to be abundantly willing to help him. So Nehemiah arrives to Jerusalem, inspects the condition of the wall in Jerusalem for himself, then encourages Jerusalem's leaders and priests to start rebuilding the wall. Well, as the people started to rebuild the wall, certain other people around them started insulting them and trying to discourage their efforts, just as had happened when they were rebuilding the temple. And instead of giving up for a bit like with the temple, though, this time, the people pressed on. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. This was what the people feared from the moment they moved back to Jerusalem and they saw the destroyed wall, that these enemy nations around them would have free reign to come in and conquer them. But again, just as he did when he heard the initial news of the situation, Nehemiah prays, and God provides opportunity to solidify their defenses. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work. Their enemies never even actually attacked, because God had promised them their home back, and he was watching over them, protecting them, and steering the enemies away. But do enemies ever even give up so easily? Well, with God protecting them, the people rebuilt the entire wall around Jerusalem in 52 days. The enemies heard about the wall being nearly finished and tried to use a different tactic to, to discourage the people. They invited Nehemiah out to a special meeting with them under the premise of having dialogue about the situation. But Nehemiah refused, knowing that it was a trick to lure him out so they could harm or even kill him, trying to discourage the people by taking out the leader who was directing their rebuilding. Over and over again, they did this back and forth dance, the enemies inviting Nehemiah, Nehemiah refusing. Some imposters in Jerusalem even tried to get Nehemiah to hide out for his safety, to which Nehemiah provides one of the best responses that we should all be applying ourselves. But I said, should a man like me run away, or should someone like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. These imposters wanted Nehemiah to run and hide from the situation, to lock himself inside the temple, using it as a bunker. But they didn't want that for his safety. They wanted him to give in to his fear, to sin by hiding and running away instead of trusting in God. For us today, we aren't really under threat of physical attack here, but we are under constant attack for our morals and beliefs. We're constantly told to keep all our thoughts, values, opinions, morals, beliefs inside our church walls. And that's the only place we're free to share them. That's our attack. And there are a lot of people who give in to those attacks, not sharing God outside of church. But that's not what we're called to do by God. We aren't called to share God with people who already believe. We're called to share Him with people who don't. And it's tough, 
because all these attacks from people will tell you that you have no place sharing. But you do. In fact, you're called to. Nehemiah stuck with his faith in God, and because of this, the wall was finally fully completed, and when all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. That's what putting your faith solely and completely in God can do. It will eventually reveal to them the truth, and it will weaken them because God is stronger than all of them put together. Let's go, boys! Let these sissies have their party! With the altar to God, the temple of God, and the wall around Jerusalem now all rebuilt, and as Nehemiah appointed people to lead and govern the city, more and more Israelites decided to return home, joining with the others. And the people dedicated time, all together, to hear God's word, delivered by the prophet Ezra and the priests, gaining an even more full understanding of God, leading to great celebration and praise to him. Unfortunately, the people, as per usual, did not stay fully committed to God, as sometime after Jerusalem was rebuilt, they started turning away from God again. So God sends what would be the final prophet in the Old Testament, Malachi. Malachi brings several stinging words and warnings from God to the people. A son honors his father and a slave his master. If I am a father, where is the honor due me? If I am a master, where is the respect due me, says the Lord Almighty? Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared among the nations. I, the Lord, do not change. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But, on top of those warnings, Malachi also brings this amazing prophecy. A prophecy of what was to come, but most importantly, of who was to come. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in days gone by, as in former years. So I will come to put you on trial. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, and perjurers, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless, and deprive the foreigners among you of justice. But do not fear me, says the Lord Almighty. And thankfully, the words of God from Malachi did reach some of the Israelites. Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. On the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty, they will be my treasured possession. I will spare them, just as a father has compassion and spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. And Malachi then offers what would be the final command from God to his people before he goes silent. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. Remember. It sounds so simple, yet how often do we not remember God, not remember what is right and wrong, not remember and give in to temptation? This final command from God to his people to close out the Old Testament is just as important a command for us today as we close out the Old Testament in this series, and as we prepare for what and who is coming. But now's your time to join the story for this week. So think about sharing where did Nehemiah find the strength and courage to continue standing strong and leading the wall rebuild in spite of all the opposition, and, and what can we learn from him? What does God mean when he says, return to me and I will return to you? And what does that mean for your life? And when God says, I the Lord do not change, what does that, that truth, that statement mean to you? So this week, let's remember. Remember God, remember his commands, remember to follow him, and I'll catch you on the next part of our journey. <laughs> <laughs>